Welcome to webinar uh, Wednesday. So today we're going to be discussing, uh, I've, I've talked to the Saskatoon Police Service and I have uh, Jeffrey uh, Nightingale with us today and we are going to talk about crime prevention through environmental design. Um, in the industry right now, we see a huge increase in lumber costs and, and supplies and we see a high demand as well. Uh, so right now is kind of a, a time where we want to protect our investment and, and watch out for potential uh, theft, uh, things like that, um, so that our, our projects can run smooth and, and also uh, we have predictable outcomes. I, I did some research today just to qualify this presentation a little bit and kind of uh, um, dig into some numbers. And I, I, I phoned up Rona and I talked to them about some of their lumber pricing that they have. And just uh, from last summer to today, um, we have three quarter inch plywood that has gone from $53 a sheet to $103. And this is at, at the Rona store. Uh, OSB went from three eighths OSB went from $11 to $62. Uh, and uh, two by four, just a simple two by four went from $4 to $10 for a stick of two by four. Um, I also find that phone their supplier. So their supplier is a, a Tega, Tega, and uh, their pricing has even gone up further. So what's happened is that the Ronas and the Home Depots of the world necessarily haven't done reordering. They have old stock that they're they're keeping their pricing based off of that stock until they have to reorder. They reorder, and as it comes in, their pricing will be reflected. Um, even a higher, op uh, a bigger uh, eye opener to that was. I was told that um, that a truckload of three eights OSB used to be about seventeen thousand dollars for that whole truckload of OSB, uh, and today pricing, if they sell at Otega, is one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars for that same truckload of OSB. Uh, significant increase, uh, even if we're losing sheets on site of wood, if we're losing, um, if we were to lose a half a lift of of OSB, that would equate to $3,500 to $4,000. And that could be lifted in a matter of minutes um, from a site or a property. Um, so I think what I'll do is we can get into this presentation. I have some other information and some, a lot of good questions uh, from industry. We're gonna use the chat function. So if anyone's watching this live and they wanna put in something in the chat function, what we'll do is I'll try to vet those questions as we go through the, the presentation, even if you want to throw those questions in there. At the end, I'll look at those questions and see if, if uh, any of them are relevant or that we didn't, weren't able to touch on in the presentation and we'll get to them. Um, so I think I'll turn it over. Jeff, thank you, or uh, Constable Nightingale, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I do have your presentation here. So if you want to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, as, my, as you said, my name is Constable Jeff Nightingale. I've been a police officer for 18 years. Uh, during the vast majority of that time, I've been in patrol. Uh, for the last two years, uh, my title's been, it's called a community liaison officer. So here in Saskatoon, I'm responsible for, you know, the North End, uh, Confed areas. I don't have a lot of the brand new construction. Uh, Kensington area is one of the areas that fall under my portfolio. Um, primarily, I'll deal with uh, companies that are getting lots of break and enters, uh, neighborhood disputes, uh, things like that. Um, so when, you know, when there's a rash of thefts in a certain area, uh, lots of break and enters, they'll task me with uh, trying to help a business with sorting out how we can you know, slow this kind of things, these things down. Obviously, you know, we're not going to stop anything, um, but our job is to make it tougher on the crooks um, and to allow the businesses some peace of mind so they don't have to feel they're getting ripped off every day. So um, the presentation that I'm going to speak about uh, crime prevention through environmental design, I'll get into what it's all about. Essentially, it's um, when you're building uh, facilities, parks, playgrounds, uh, it helps you before you're actually building these uh, facilities to prepare yourself 
to prevent the crime before it even happens. And we'll talk about how that all works as I go through the slides. Wonderful. Well, why don't I just start sharing the screen here and we'll get right into it. Sure. And then if you want to just let me know when to, to flip the slides and stuff like that, that would work great. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, I just one thing I want to point out on the first slide um, of the guru for SEPTED, which is the abbreviation, uh, is Elizabeth Miller. And this, these slides came from her uh, via the City of Saskatoon planning and development uh, area with the city. Next slide. So just some simple what is SEPTED, uh, the SEPTED principles. Uh, their key strategy in Saskatoon here uh, to help with neighborhood safety. Um, it identifies problems. It helps you pro uh, solve these said problems, um, come up with solutions to issues. And agencies and entities that are uh, take part in this are, as I mentioned, uh, the city earlier, uh, the police service, um, the business improvement districts. So uh, the essentially the the business areas in in specific parts of the town. Uh, they're the, the stakeholders uh, that want SEPTED working in their communities. And it's not only new, it's uh, rebuilds. It's, uh, you know, when you totally gut an area, well, you want to build a property when you uh, rebuild it. So they may get a hold of the city and get some SEPTED uh, advice prior to uh, reconstruction and things like that. So next slide. So this would, uh this principle these principles can be addressed in the planning phase of a site or even your yard if you're going to be fencing up your yard stuff like that as uh, to help with crime prevention this stuff can really be a proactive approach instead of just a reactive okay we've had problems and stuff like that this is how we fix these problems i guess from both perspectives it could be utilized hey yeah and it's it's important actually you know it's like anything and if you pre-plan it's going to cost you way less money so if you build your property uh, according to the, some of these SEPTED principles, you won't have to tear a few things down later to make it work. So as you know, you know you're better off doing it right off the bat. But during the reconstruction phases of rebuilds and and uh, renovations, it's also a good time to do it. So, well, I could I could attest to that in my in my shop here. I put a camera system in, and I did that prior to insulating and and all the osb and all of that and I, I equate it to how many hours would i have to put into this project if i put this camera system in at a later date right yeah exactly you, you can you, everybody's got a million examples of how they should have done something when they're building their house right prior to uh cat five and all those things that people talk about now um so essentially it's uh modifying so septed is modifying the build environment so actually what you are building uh, to reduce the opportunity for crime to occur and to re reduce people's fear of crime. So um, next slide. So it, SEPTED takes design and management and activity strategies. Uh, like I said, it reduces the opportunity for crime to occur, it takes away people's fear, for example, in this park and improves quality of life. So in, for an example, in a park, you're going to say, well, that's beautiful. Um, why would anybody be fearful of the park? So a, a simple fix, you know, much to the tree lover chagrin, is if this little park is out of uh, sight of the road, out of sight of the uh, sidewalks, now you just created a haven for people to slide in there and do drugs or drink kids to drink on these playgrounds. And then the kids find needles the next day, things like that. So a simple fix and would be, either cut the trees up a little bit. So, you know, people walking their dogs on the sidewalk can see them cars driving by would see what's going on in the park. Another simple fix would be to light up the walkways. Um, so the guys that are trying to hide in the, in the dark aren't gonna wanna use it. So these are things we'll, we'll talk with it as we go. Uh, next slide there, Mike. So essentially how this works. So the, the SEPTED principles First off, you're going to do the risk assessments. Is it actually required in the neighborhood? Um, so we, anybody can request it for their for their neighborhood or their their construction build in an apartment complex or things like that. Um, is there a safety issue? Is there actually a problem? Uh, they can you can do audits and through SEPTED. If you get a full SEPTED done on a on a project, 
They'll look at the crime in the area. They'll look at what's needed, how many police calls or service, what types of calls, all these kind of things are done uh, to assist you in, in deciding whether or not you even need to change your plans uh, when you're maybe doing a rental or things like that. Um, they'll get the community participation. The, the SEPTED actually interviews people in the neighborhood um, just to get their perspective. Of, is there even crime? Is it is the building just broken down and, and wrecked and there's no crime going on there. This is where you'll find it in the in the uh, police stats and, and speaking with the people. So the final stage is, is uh, implementing what you've done and then all these things are evaluated in an ongoing basis. So next one there, Mike. So on, on that, I'll just uh, interject and ask a question. Yep. On this, how is, what kind of situations would someone you want to be part of having a septed evaluation done and how is that done like how, who do they contact and how is something like that done and in what situations okay so here in saskatoon um like with the city planning department i i do believe say if you're building a brand new apartment complex it'll be part of the planning stage that you need a septed done um and that's why they have uh, elizabeth miller uh, as the full-time person doing this so for example, if you're, we'll use an apartment complex, uh, stick build from, from scratch, or even uh, they're gonna wanna know if, it, if they say they're building in an older neighborhood, is there a lot of crime? Do we need to put up a fence all the way around this building? Um, do we have to have underground parking? Is there a lot of cars being broken into in a, in a daily basis? So right off the bat, before you, you, they put a shovel into the ground, you're gonna know yeah, we've got no worries in this neighborhood. Everything, all the cars can be outside. You know, something simple as that um, when you're deciding because if you're not going to want, uh, uh, you know, older people aren't going to want to live there if, when they're carrying their groceries from their car that there's bums sliding by and asking them for money. So these are the kind of things the SEPTED can provide and the city um, will assist with almost any SEPTED request and whether or not it's an in-depth one or just the basic uh, queries. So that could be done on an existing operation. For example, that lumber yard that had, uh, they said they had a, a couple of, a uh, few break-ins in the last, you know, a couple months or whatever. And it was all from the same character, I guess. They, they uh, be in an existing location and stuff like that. They could also have an evaluation done for their property. Is that, would that be correct? Or? Yeah, and with, with something like that, they can actually call the community liaisons, like similar to myself, because these are things that I would do um, if, if the, my supervisors would notice that there's a bunch of b and at a lumber yard and the break and enter people may be looking for a suspect, but in the meantime, they're looking for advice on how to keep him or her and other people out. So that's, I, I can simply like, I've done a, a few, um, uh, I think scrap yards, things like that, where there were people were kind of sneaking in and stealing, you know, scrap and then reselling it back and things like that. And, you know, it, it just took a little bit of digging to figure out a couple things. And lighting is, is huge in those kind of yards, especially if thefts at night. Um, I'll go into a little bit of a scenario later uh, um, on how, say, I'll, I'll just use a, uh, just building an apartment complex. Some of the things we can do from the start to the finish, and I'll kind of talk about it as we go along. But you can go to the next slide there, Mike. Throw, I think there's two there. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, the SEPTED um, looks at a lot of the uh, crime in itself. But the big thing are the 85% of crime reported is, is, you know, the victimless crimes we say. So, so this is thefts, uh, vandalism, breaking enters, which the majority of the people that are going to be watching this video and are, are going to be thinking of and, and talking about. So um, one other one I would add on there, which I want uh, people to pay attention to is the, the loitering and, and suspicious people. So there's a lot of times uh, if a person is just loitering or hanging out, they could, they could be scoping out the place. They might not be the guy doing the thefts. Um, it might be a friend of ours that, that sells lumber on, on Facebook or whatever, right? And this person's just pretending to be hanging out. Well, now you guys own the property. You, 
you can ask people to leave at any time. And if they don't, or they return, then you can call the police and say, we've told this guy to leave five times. Um, he doesn't look like he's doing it wrong, but we're worried that when we leave tonight, he's going to come back. So that's when you can call the police once you've told people. So the suspicious people, um, I want, you know, it's one of the things I'm going to hit on as we go through here. Um, not everyone's showing up with a flatbed truck. And, and like, if you can imagine, there's guys that are carrying two, three, two by fours on a bike with a wagon and it's happening. So you got everything from the losing a whole lift to two or three boards a night. But as you know, two or three boards nowadays are adding up. So anyway, so the, there's multiple different things that uh, SEPTED does, but like I said, the loitering, um, people vandalizing sites is not as big a thing nowadays because it just seems to me that, you know, uh, the sites are, are a little better kept. So I don't know, we'll talk about that later, but if you keep your site tidy and, and not as much garbage flying around, then people are less likely to just swing in there and party and cause damage. So we'll, uh, next slide there, Mike. I heard that a lot of upper, a lot of uh, crime or, or theft is very opportunistic as well. Hey, like it's very, so these innocent kind of walking by checking door handles, if it's unlocked, they go in and steal things, things like that, a gate left open, lumber not covered, stuff like that, where it's just opportunistic. And it just seems like they're, they really capitalize on that. They have, uh, they have a lot of guts when it comes to the, that kind of opportunity, eh? Yeah, and and you know, without the stats sitting in front of me, and uh, I I can from my experience, that's probably the vast majority of them. There are there are a few what we call shoppers, like people that are just driving around in their trucks, hoping that somebody leaves their gate open at the end of the night, and they'll swing in and grab, you know, a, a pallet of whatever. Um, there's there are those, but when those are the actually the, end, the ones we end up catching. Because those are the ones driving vehicles. Those are the ones that are around at two, three in the morning that, um, you know, we have surveillance out there. We have planes. We have patrol guys pulling over cars that are, you know, in, in these areas when they shouldn't be. Um, the ones that we most likely don't catch and adds up in the long run are the ones that are the ones that are just driving by and say, hey, I, I need 10 two by fours there, or I can sell those two by fours for five dollars each. And those are the ones that are going to add up. The, the the big ones are they're out there they're the, the most they're the costly ones and i'm going to talk about it later unfortunately those are the only ones that are getting reported right so when they're when somebody's missing 10 15 two by fours um they're not making a big deal about it they're not even mentioning it because they figure their guys waste that much in a day so they're not worried about it they worry when there's a whole pallet gone right but what I'm going to hit on as we go through here, and I know it's a pain for the police services, but now we have online reporting. So you don't even, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of work to report those 10 two by fours gone. And, you know, eventually, you know, 10 and then next weekend, it's another 10, you know, we're talking thousands of dollars. And without that report, what excuse do I as a police officer have to pull over the guy on the bike with the 10 two by fours? Right. I have no grounds because I've never had any reports of anything missing from this area. So without those reports, and you get to think of the world is now police need lots of justification to pull people over and to talk to them without any justification. So you guys are helping us do our jobs by reporting these. And then the next time I see a guy with 10 two by fours, I can say, well, this site has been ripped off two by fours over the last couple months. That's why I pulled this guy over. And then that saves me from getting in trouble down the road, say for any other reason, right? So it, it provides us with the, the grounds. If nobody's ever reported, I have no reason to stop that guy. So in that, something uh, interesting too is, I'm just gonna keep pausing this. Um, so if if there was a like a lift of, of uh, two by fours or a bunch of uh, studs or something that are there, and, and a company knows they're leaving it on site. Would it be, uh, would it be, kind of evidence or something linking it if they took like some spray paint and spray painted the ends of their two by fours blue or something, and then that you could be able to tell, hey, look, this guy on the on the bike with the ten two by fours, they they have all the ends are spray painted blue. Like, how often is that going to happen that someone would do that? So, would that be yeah. a good link? If if 
that would 100% help. Uh, it's no different than you marking your tools, right? So how many DeWalt drills are out there? If we have probably a half a warehouse full of unmarked DeWalt dr drills that we can't give back to anybody because they haven't identified them. So the big thing is if you're going to paint the ends, paint them all the same. Yeah. Don't one day paint green, one day paint blue, one day paint fluorescent. So that is your guys' trademark. Um, and then, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have to go back and, but at least you can say, I can call the owner the next day saying, hey, we arrested this guy from your site. He had a bunch of two by fours and he's saying he picked them up in the ditch a block away. And you tell me, well, if he's got ours, they're all painted blue on the end. That's a slam dunk for court. Okay, so that's helping us as well as yourself. And it's also another thing for insurance too, like, okay, Mr. Insurance, provider we've been taking these steps to identify this at the request of the police um and then you know it, it makes their their uh, claims a little bit more justifiable so okay all right um so what septed actually does so you can you take the principles of septed and we're going to get into them here in a little bit and so what's the big picture? So this is just a, a sign in, in the city of Saskatoon here. Um, so my thoughts are, I was to bring in everyone to picture, you know, a brand new 24 apartment complex that's being built. Okay, so the, it's just the start of the build, uh, plywood, OSB line all over, things like that going on and what's how do we keep things not only from disappearing now uh, but when this building is done how do we keep theft from happening from these individuals uh, apartments how do we keep vehicles from being broken into and vandalized so these are all things that you think of and this is what a septed would do it looks at, at the, the the big picture uh, and the risk assessment right from the day the shovel hits the ground until people are living in it. Call MacArthur, call 8206, MacArthur 8206. Sorry about that. Um, till when people are living in it way down the road. So these are, it, it takes it from, uh, right from, like I said, from step one to till it's all done. And and even 10 years after people are living in it, you things are gonna change and the neighborhood will change. And if you've already, you know, you have wiring and plumbing and, or sorry, uh, and uh, parking in the correct spots, you know, there won't be a lot of changes. And as we said, if you don't do it up front and you realize down the road that, wow, we should have did this from the beginning. And now you have to reconfigure your parking lots or put different lighting in everywhere. Now things are expensive. So, all right, we'll go to the next one. We'll get into how these all work. So I'm gonna go break down each one of these uh, principles as we go, but the four principles, I'm going to speak about our natural surveillance. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, access control. I'll have some examples. Um, image. We already spoke a little bit. Uh, maintenance. How tidy things are. Uh, and territoriality. So making it your own. And I'll have some examples for each one of those. So if you can jump to natural surveillance. So part of the natural surveillance with SEPTED is you know the landscaping of the building, the lighting that's going on, sight lines, um, and eyes on the street. So. One good example of this is when you're thinking about that apartment complex, um, do you want like a snow fence that you can't see through a uh, gate all the way around the property or would you rather have a chain link? So the idea is have the more eyes on the street, the better. So if it's kind of funny to think, yeah, you always want to hide everything so everybody, so no one knows your stuff is in there. The idea of this is good sight lines and eyes on the street, meaning anybody that drives by can see that guy at four in the morning loading a lift of lumber onto his truck. Whereas if you have a solid fence or a place for them to hide or you park your lifts kind of hidden, so this guy can swing his truck in there and load it and then just bolt out of there, nobody sees him doing this. So the idea is if you're gonna have a lift and leave it there overnight, you know, you're gambling, but don't hide it around the corner don't put it uh, somewhere where they uh, can easily load it. Uh, lighting is huge, especially when it's, uh, when you're in this, this day and age, uh, unfortunately, you can decide which is cheaper, higher in security, 
or lighting up the whole place, the grounds and where all the property is and all the, the lumber um, from the top of the building, just so people know that, wow, I, I'm not going in there. The lights are too bright and there's no way I can knock them out because the lights are up on top of the building. So, you know, th that, that's also good. So the sight lines is mo more talking about, um, you know, too many trees and things like that, but sight lines also work. Uh, you want, would like to park your things that you're leaving there overnight closer to the road, not beside it to make it too easy, but uh, so that people walking by with their dogs or um, somebody going by at night um, would notice some strange person wearing all black uh, covering his face, loading up a truck. Well, that phone call is going to be made to the police pretty quick. So that's natural surveillance. We'll get you to go to the next one. Okay, so that's, I just want to touch on this uh, a little bit because there's a lot of, um, in talking to the lumber yards and that there's there's this idea of a closed lift of wood and then one that's open and one that's an open lift of wood for them for someone to grab three or four sheets of a hundred and ten dollar a sheet three quarter inch plywood which would not take very long to so maybe from a yard stance it's good to have a light assign a, a site a line of sight into that in all your equipment and, and your and your stuff but would you recommend then also tarping some of the, the the stuff within the site so it's not so apparent of what's under that tarp not so interesting to the criminal well yes and no you're you're there for if if they're actually if if it's a new build and it's 10 feet long and it's got a, a blue tarp over it i'm pretty sure they know what's underneath it um so if you're gonna do it make sure you tie it up and and it's not just just hanging over there um that's the train of thought there you're better off if you're going to do that put it in plain view so when like i said two in the morning somebody's uncovering that well obviously that's not you know an, an employee um i'm going to talk about it in a bit but one of the other contrary to the natural surveillance is kind of changing the way um people are constructing uh, my example i'll talk about a little bit later i might as well get into it now is uh one of the first things you could do is actually say you're building a brand new house, put the garage doors on first and then, you know, store a lift the lumber inside the garage. So that's, right. you know, it's just one thought, right? And instead of, I know when my house was built, that was the very last thing that went on uh, just for convenience, but you may have to change your order of, of building uh, or if you have underground parking, start storing a few things down there. So, um, there's something popped on my screen here. Oh, are chains and locks effective? Is that from you, Mike? I think this is uh, in the chat. I'll I'll watch that chat if you want to minimize that. I'll just watch that and kind of keep okay. It. Yeah. Okay. All good. I'll uh, I can address that in a bit. Okay. So so access control. This is uh, I'm gonna I was going to talk about it a little. I can cover it here too. So controlling who comes in and out of uh, a neighborhood uh, building park. Um, it, it's this can be formal, informal. So formal means signage, arrows pointing where to go. On a yard site, I say we'll go back to this 24 uh, complex building, um, putting up the temporary fencing around and only having one entrance. So anybody coming and going from that site is going to use that entrance. And now when you think about it, say the plumber's there doing work and he sees this truck coming and going, uh, the electrician comes and he sees the plumber going. They all kind of get to know each other. They know where that access is. So now when some strange guy's moving the fence and back in his truck in there at the back, there's going to be multiple people that know that that person doesn't belong. So access control takes another step when it comes to a completed property. Uh, it has to do with a lot more where the main entrance is. Um, for example, uh, as, as a policeman and fire have the same problem, if we pull up to a big complex and there's four doors and all of them look like the main entrance, we don't know how to get in for the emergency, right? So that's an example of, of where this is used in a finished product. You want the main entrance to have the biggest lights and the biggest signage and the biggest sidewalk and actually a parking stall um, just so people know where to go and, and backtrack a bit to the complex. You still want that same entrance. You want to put um, you know, the big address right there. So people know where to go and that is the entrance. Um, and nowadays having the, the, uh, personnel check in, check out depends how, how busy it is. Um, 
you know, unfortunately, a lot of crime happens amongst your almost peers, right? Amongst the contractors are stealing from each other, right? So um, if the plumber's coming and he's all of a sudden leaving with 10 two by fours, well, you might want to talk to the foreman, right? So having that one entrance that everyone uses it is can cut down on that as well. So, so yeah. something, something on that topic, um, there, uh, sometimes I think a lot of companies for access control and, to, and for just for site control will potentially be parking bol concrete bullets in front of their entrances at the end of the day or putting lifts of wood at the entrance the, uh, at the end of the day and stuff like that. Something of interest is, is that potentially what I've heard is that we want to be checking with our insurance agencies and stuff like that because if we're blocking all entrances and there's, for example, a fire on site and emergency services can't get into the site because they do not have access, that may impact it, what I've heard anyway may impact insurance. Uh, I, have, uh, I haven't I have heard that complaint yet, unless right. it's a full lockout, meaning I can't get in in any way. Right. Um, but if you have, say, those those blue temporary fences that we can just throw off and, 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 and jump in with a fire truck and things like that, then it's not a big deal. Um, that it's, that's a deterrent. Um, but like you said, I haven't heard anybody being denied. I work with fire department on a regular basis. And as long as there's, even if the main entrance is boarded up and barricaded, if somebody can get in a secondary way, there shouldn't be any issues with insurance. Great. Thanks for that. Yep. Okay. Next slide. So this is quite evident. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the broken window theory, uh, but in relation to image and maintenance, um, this is simple, simple thoughts, right? Everybody wants a perfectly clean site. Um, and if, if you're, say your lifts of lumber look like, a, a, you know, a dropped book of matches, um, the vandals are sorry the criminals are going to swing by and say they're never going to know i took five two by fours right um or everything's not piled at the end of the day um you got a, a pile of five over there a pile of ten over there um and you know things are strewn all over and there there's lumber tarps blowing all over the yard that's going to be a victim because that criminal is going to know right off the bat these guys aren't organized they're not going to phone in they're they're, this if this is the kind of operation that says, I know I'm going to get away with this. So that's kind of the thought. And the broken window theory, um, I like to use the analogy of, um, you know, two or three 10 year old boys walking down the street and they see an old derelict house with a broken window and they say, Hey, I, there's rocks here. I'm going to see if I can take out these other windows. Well, these aren't criminals, but they say there's already one broken. What's going to be another one? Nobody's going to care. Right. So, the idea is that window should be fixed and then those kids won't have that train of thought. So it's kind of the same with criminals. They, they see an opportunity that people aren't caring for a yard or, or, you know, that guy's always leaving his stuff outside. He's not even, he'll notice in a couple of weeks that he's missing his snowblower. Right. So uh, that's the idea, right? So you keep things tidy and then uh, it makes things a little tougher. On them. I think the next one there. I've heard with the with uh, repetitive uh, graffiti uh, areas and stuff like that, a lot of that comes down to their graffiti stays in the position. So they like that uh, numerous people can see their artwork or whatever it is that they deem this kind of graffiti is going, it, the purpose behind it or whatever. But if the cleanup's done right away, they start they start avoiding that area. Is that would that be correct? Yeah, yeah. And there's actually a bylaw for businesses. They have to. They have. They only have like 72 hours to clean it off. And that's what it's all about, right? So not only, you know, uh, people doing the spray painting are usually criminals of some sort. And not only are they vandalizing, you know, a lot of them are tagging. So it's a gang related thing. So they're tagging saying this, this brand new building that you're building is now mine or my gang, stay away from here. So if you erase that, now, you know, they've lost that power. So it's kind of taken away their power. All right, so territoriality is, is basically controlling. This would be, we'll go back to the 24 complex uh, building, uh, ownership of it. So not only you're going to put uh, 118 whatever avenue, you're going to put um, Johnny Joe's Construction Company 
right on the door. They're going to, you're going to advertise. This is, I'm building this. I know people like to do it for advertisement, but it's also showing that I, this is my property. You're stealing, you're stealing from me. That, that it throws it out there and versus just this wide open, you know, complex, no gate, no fence, no entrance. We don't know who runs it. Um, strangely enough, criminals, if they know a lot of times, if they, you know, if they, if it's just a random person that you don't know who it is, they, they may steal from you. But if all of a sudden you, they, they've met this person, they may go to the next guy. They, they don't want to, or, Hey, I used to work for those guys. I like those guys. So it's, it's owning the property, um, shows how, you know, it's clean, it's tidy. Um, you know, that's the, uh, and what company doesn't want to be known for being, uh, tidy and this this territorial ownership of it uh will help with that too so next there mike so it's not just dealing with crime the septet so it focuses on the neighborhood and the community uh gives gives the community the feeling of uh taking part uh you know they'll give their advice and say yeah well, there was a bunch of crime in that that park and now we've given our advice and now they've cleaned up this whole park because they did the septet. So that's good. Um, it takes away a lot of the opportunities for crime for the above mentioned things we talked about just briefly. Um, and, you know, obviously you take away their, their things they're able to steal, it takes away their money. Um, and reducing crime takes away victims. So fewer victims, right. And then there's less people out there that are losing their houses and things like that because they were the victims of crime. And, Septed helps with perceptions of safety. And like, if you feel safe in that park, because other people can see you entering said park, um, you're going to go in the park, which again puts, hey, somebody will say, hey, that mom with the stroller and their little dog is going to that park now. Maybe I'll feel okay going into the park. So it kind of gives them back their uh, sense of safety uh, when you take away the crime that's going on. So next one there, Mike. So in that, I, I just like to touch on uh, community uh, prevention. So is there, a, what about the, the block parent program or the, the what was the one um, that is like uh, the community crime prevention? Uh, it wasn't block parent, it was something else, but it basically, it, even in an area like Kensington, talking to other contractors about, you know, the area, you know, keeping your finger on the pulse of crime in the area, stuff like that, it could be advantageous, I'm sure. Yeah, there's a bunch of different, uh, like there's, uh, it's called Safer Communities and Neighborhoods. Uh, so they're task force that are actually, so if you call in and you complain in your neighborhood saying that I believe there's a drug dealer down the street, um, they'll actually, they're a, uh, their provincial agency that actually will watch this house. Uh, and then if they get evidence, they'll report it to the police saying, yeah, we do believe this is a drug house, or they actually will give us evidence saying, no, there's nothing really, this is just a neighborhood dispute, things like that. So yes, there are a bunch of agencies out there that will assist and uh, they, they're, they're all part of the septet. So when they're, when the septet is done for a, a project, those are all things that are looked at, whether or not SCAN, which is safe for communities and neighborhoods, um, was dealing with any properties in the vicinity of said park or new uh, complex. So that's all part of it. Yeah, you can jump to the next one there. So uh, we've mentioned it already, uh, that can be applied to brand new sites, uh, existing sites that are just want some help uh, and redevelopment. So. Existing sites is where it's going to cost you a little bit more money, but if you're planning on redoing an entire building, well, you're going to want all these principles at your fingertips, right? So um, knowing these things ahead of time, sight lines, where you should put lights, um, which part of the neighborhood is getting uh, vandalized or crimed, you're going to want to know all these things. You're going to want to know where to put your parking lots, where you want better lighting and things like that. So these are the... Uh, uh, where the septet principles can be utilized so yeah next one there okay so like i said the earliest part of uh, the development of is is the best right it's going to be the cheapest so you don't have to backtrack on things um and like you said the septet will 
real life. They'll they'll uh, talk to the adults, the kids, the businesses in the neighborhoods, uh, the community in general, the stakeholders, the uh, business community, um, and they'll look into they they have access to the police records and and, and political things and uh, information as to what kind of people live in the neighborhoods and all these uh, what they pull into a septed. When I first got trained in it, I I never thought any of that went into planning of a neighborhood. Uh, it, it was good to see that in the, it's about in the last 10 years, it's it's uh, it's been utilized quite a bit, especially in Saskatoon. Next one there, Mike. So I've heard of the term crime hardening. What is, do you guys ever use that term or is that kind of the, some of these principles where we just make it so it's a less opportunistic kind of area of the city or of a project? Yeah, so crime hardening is kind of what SEPTA is doing. It's basically making it harder for them to commit crime. So one easy thing, crime hardening, you think about it as simple as I lock, I put a big fat paddle lock on my shed. That's crime hardening. So you're making it, they don't just have to pull on the door to steal my, you know, my bike. I have this big paddle lock on there. So that's a simple task. Um, I know we talk about the thefts that have been going on. I just grabbed this stat from our one of our uh, crime analysts, and she was able to just pull uh, the three neighborhoods that we have uh, quite a bit going on in Saskatoon, uh, Aspen Ridge, Brighton, and Kensington. In 2020, March of 2020, they had zero um, building material thefts and beanies. And it, in 2021, it jumped to four. Um, obviously we know that it looks like April's the hot month, uh, for them to start. Um, so April of 20, sorry, March of 2020, it went, it jumped to seven and 10. So those numbers aren't drastic. Uh, but I think with the cost of lumber and building materials jumping, uh, it's becoming a, a bigger topic. Um, but like I said, in both these stats and when I leave here, I'm going to hammer on everybody that can possibly think about it. Now that we have online reporting, you don't even have to go into too much detail, but we need the stats in order to get more police members to patrol those areas, to spend more time out there. And as I mentioned before, if there's crimes going on in there, in that area where we know that there's a theft of plywood or shingles and things like that, and we pull over a strange vehicle at two in the morning, uh, the matches the description well now we've we've justified that and we can maybe backtrack in charge with three or four thefts versus just the one theft that's going on right so um like i said it's much easier uh, unfortunately covid's been horrible for everybody uh however what it did it pointed out to the police service that we need another way to make some of these uh reporting done because we weren't able to go to a lot of these minor thefts and things like that during covid and it, we realize this is a great way uh, for and for businesses that don't want to, you know, have to see a police mo policeman or waste an hour dealing with a, a patrol member. They can just when they get home at night, they can type out everything they want to say and, and hand it in. If there's no suspects, you can do an online report. So I guess one of the advantage, one of the advantages of this too is even this the the not the smallest of thefts but something mediocre where they decide even not to go through insurance and they decide oh you know what i don't want to go through like the bothersome of of an hour dealing or two hours dealing with the reporting process and that to speed that process up and and to make it more user friendly you can also get they probably with the accessibility to camera systems now the wi-fi camera systems and that kind of stuff when there is a vehicle and it's even a vague description like a purple truck and, and that that happening on a site where they stole five five sheets of plywood could definitely be information or even that vague picture of it to help the police service in identifying more crime with those uh, suspects. Eh? Yeah, especially uh, rural towns, Saskatoon and Regina may be a little different, but honestly, I, I could probably, like on any given evening um, across the city, it's fairly quiet. So if you have a truck rolling around and two nights ago, there was a purple truck stealing lumber and I see a purple truck, there's a good chance it's the same one. Yeah. So if nobody did the initial report, I don't have that info, right? So uh, I, the purple truck just drives right on by with, with that 10 minute report that the, the uh, business did, 
uh, I have a reason to pull them over and, and maybe it'll link to thefts, right? So that's, that's all important. Um, basically, how can I use SEPTED, meaning you guys? Um, so the idea is to develop a culture of security and safety on your work site. So the actual work site, and I've mentioned it numerous different ways that you guys can do it and everyone's gonna have their own idea, but the, the main plan is, is security and safety. So um, good lighting, you know, the territoriality, all those things I mentioned. Um, and I wanted to remind you it, it's everybody's responsibility. So, and we'll go back to the 24 complex apartment. Um, the employees say the plumber's in there doing work and he's using the same entrance. It's his responsibility to let somebody know that there's some electrician that was in there that is not one of the electricians that he saw the day before, right? So you just let somebody know and, and you know, it's the competition just checking out what's going on, fine. But uh, they also could be in there stealing breakers, right? So you, you, it's everybody's responsibility, not it's, it's if it just sits on the shoulder of the police, um, we're going to go backwards, right? We need everybody out there uh, doing their part in identifying these guys. Um, we know very well that we can't lock down all these big sites and neighborhoods. So it's going to take everybody's eyes uh, that are working on these sites. And so, like I mentioned, we've mentioned, so report them. They're way easier, no matter how minor uh, these incidents are. Uh, I mentioned earlier about suspicious persons. So, um, you know, the guy just roaming around the site, um, you know, have somebody ask him to leave. Like, you don't have any reason to be here. You can, you can leave, but take note of what this person looks like. So if you guys have surveillance cameras and that guy's on it the next night, right. We're going to know that that guy was scoping things out. So everybody, everybody's has to play a part and, uh, because this is, it's going to get, unfortunately, it's going to get worse before it gets better um, from the stats Mike provided. Uh, lumbers, I, I heard a, watching the news last night, went up 500% coming right off the tree. So their costs are skyrocketing, which as, as Mike was saying, now that's 10 times at the lumber store. So, um, so one other example, uh, things that I was talking with uh, my coworkers, is planning a workday around having more site or more staff on the site for a longer period of time. I know everybody likes to be eight to four, right? Um, however, I've been in construction. When everybody's there at the same time, there's a lot of people tripping on each other's toes. So possibly one, one suggestion would, would be, you know, having a, having a shift. So somebody's eight to four and somebody's, you know, two to 10, uh, whatever the bylaws allow for the noise, right? So stretch it out as far as you can. And then you only have, you have less time of the day to worry about having to secure that site. Um, and then in the evenings, if you have to hire security, now it's only 10 hours instead of, you know, 24 or sorry, 20 hours or where you got to hire somebody. Uh, another example is if it's a smaller job, um, say you're one company building a, a, just building a house, somebody in the neighborhood, staggering their meal breaks, like saying, hey, you, you guys are taking your lunch at, at this time today. I don't want to leave this site unattended. Then you don't have to pack up all your stuff every time that, that you leave. Uh, worst case scenario is just leave everything where it sits and come back and it's all missing. So, you know, these are all simple things that are, uh, are irritation. But like I said, everybody has to kind of take their part um, uh, in order to combat uh, these thieves. Because honestly, we, the, the city is, is, is huge. And to be honest with you, we're going to go where all the people are. Right. And as far as the police service, as I mentioned earlier, stealing lumber is still a victimless crime. So we need help. We're, we're not going to patrol a lot of those areas when somebody in the middle of the city where all the people are getting stabbed. So think, think about that from a crime stat, we're going to worry about people over property. So we need you guys to take your part on doing a bunch of things I've talked about. So next slide there. Mike. So uh, one other thing I talked about earlier is, is locking things in the, in, the, in the garage. So example would be building the garage doors, one of the first things you do. So when you leave, you just got to roll down the garage and now that, that, that stuff is secure. Unfortunately, you have to kind of change your, the way you operate, where you build a building. So that's something you could think about. And as I mentioned with the territoriality, this is also a big one, uh, especially if you want everybody to take part, uh, having a designated entry and exit point. 
um, don't necessarily have to barricade things out, but when you're, uh, you know, you're building a site, leave the berms and leave the big piles of rocks around the edges and only have one spot where, where it's obvious that people uh, can come and go. And then uh, the criminals are forced to use that entrance as well, which can in turn, you only have to have one camera instead of 15 cameras, right? So that's kind of the idea behind that. But, uh, Mike, you have any questions there for you? Yeah, I sure do. I'm just going to stop sharing here. Okay, so um, thanks for that presentation. The I have a few questions here. I've heard this is this is a stat that I heard, and I just like your opinion on this. Uh, this was this came out of another Septed uh, presentation I saw, and she had said that three percent of intersections constitute fifty percent of crime. I, I, it's a weird lay way of looking at it, but essentially hot areas would be, uh, you know, these are your high uh, frequency crime areas. That, well, that is a stat that it, it, it is true. Uh, you look at our, our downtown uh, district in Saskatoon, it's the smallest, smallest district we have, but it's also 63% of the crime in the city. Um, so when it comes to policing, that's where 63% of the cops are at all times. All our new builds, a vast majority of them, are all on the outskirts of the city. So now you can see why I'm asking for everybody's help in, in resolving this issue. So um, yes, that's a very true stat. And it also, when it comes to criminals, um, it, it's it's probably like two percent of the criminals are doing most of the crime, right? So a lot of the crime that's out there is the, the like you said, the odd guy stealing the odd two by four or or lift. But the ones that are prolific, that's their job. And those are the ones that are, are costly. So, but those are also the ones that we usually know who they are. So if you do see the purple truck, make sure somebody says, um, I saw that purple truck and, and I heard it, it, it steals things. It didn't steal anything from us, but it was a su suspicious vehicle in our area. Call that in and make sure we know, or at least make sure somebody knows in authority that uh, when there's a theft at the yard down down the way, that everybody knows. And another thing is is every, I know everybody likes to keep their, um, you know, Johnny's construction site and 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 Jane's construction site don't like to talk, but everybody's gonna have to. Like, when you get stuff stolen, make sure the place down the road say, hey, we we've had a bunch of stuff stolen. Heads up, everybody's got to start participating, and, or else these guys are gonna keep winning. Right. Re really good example. The uh, when I talked to Tiega, the the gentleman there was super friendly and helpful. He said that they had been robbed. Like he said, uh, they had been stolen stuff from them uh, two times, and the third time they they stole stuff. That same perpetrator was at their competitor ASA over there stealing stuff on top of what did he say? He was up on five lifts of wood. He's climbed on top to to throw sheets down, and and that's where they caught this perpetrator. And then still got away on foot, so is out at large right now. But without them collaborating and talking, or maybe they could have even sooner. This perpetrator, this one perpetrator that's targeting these lumber supply stores or lumber suppliers, uh, you know, they get they gather a lot more data for the police service and and for their own uh, yeah. own, own information. Yeah, and like you're saying, you're and you can easily. It's not a competitor thing. It's hey, we got ripped off. They may head your way. And in the meantime, you're saying it's that purple truck. It's it's right. it's that uh, 40 year old male in the purple truck, right? And that's all you, you're not giving away trade secrets. You're just saying, hey, be careful. And in, but in doing so, they may call the police when they see the purple truck roll up in the middle of the day because he's scoping out the site for tonight, right? So. And, and then the next thing you know, you don't have to fix so many cut fences because the competitor has helped you to catch the perpetrator a lot earlier than cutting your fence over and over and over again. Yeah. I, I got a kind of a funny example about fencing and gating areas. I had a, uh, a property I was at, uh, it was a cleanup. It was a, you know, a prolific thief lived there, but we, we hadn't caught him doing anything. And I saw a jerry can with a construction company's name written on it in, in, in Jiffy, like permanent marker. And I knew this guy wasn't employed. And the funny thing was, was I called them and they knew the jerry can was missing. And I said, well, 
I was there at this house three days before and I said the jerry can was not there. So I had this uh, construction company check their video and they actually, we caught this guy in the compound stealing this jerry can. And it was as simple as that, but they didn't report the missing jerry can, right? Ever, right? And why would you? Um, but the funny thing was the guy got into the compound and couldn't get his way out. <laughs> That's what the video showed. Anyway, <laughs> it can be quite, quite funny. But yeah. So um, a couple more questions. The, on trailer locks, something as simple as a trailer lock, is this even, these deterrents that are obviously not foolproof or even signage, uh, stuff like this, that is more of a deterrent than it is an actual physical barrier so much. Even these trailer locks can just be, you know, zip cut it off and stuff like that. Yeah. Do these things help secure these items? Yeah, and most of the construction guys have made all the moves that I would suggest. Uh, obviously, not locking is not smart uh, because not everyone's carrying a, a, you know, a 24 volt zip cutter, right? So, you know, that's how easy it is to cut. Um, but like simple as, you know, parking your equipment in front of it, putting the, the bucket up against the doors, things like that. Um, however, in doing so, you do that and you park it underneath a light in plain view of people driving down the street. You don't hide it around the corner because you think you're hiding it because all that's doing is helping the guy that's cutting it, giving him a place to hide while he's cutting, right? Kind of, you can still use both. So use your, uh, the security of the locks in, in, the, in the Bobcat, but put it underneath the light or where you have a camera and advertise the camera and make sure it's high enough they can't get to it. And in plain view of the street, um, I, I know guys that do road construction and they don't get broke into because they park underneath lights on the road. And the one guy told me when he did park because uh, he didn't have a permit, he parked one of his trailers on, in a parking stall and that's the one that got broke into. So that's a good example. So a multi, multi-layered approach is obviously going to be the best, the best yep. approach. And, and I'm assuming your return on investment with all of this stuff is even just your insurance claim with your insurance costs going up and stuff like that, your return on investment is going to be substantial being proactive. Yeah. And what I've heard from insurance companies is even if you're not putting a claim, they want to know you're not. And this is a strength. They want to know. Uh, so when you do get a, a theft of $15,000 worth of lumber, you can say I reported 10 times to the police where I had 10 or 15 stolen, but I didn't put in a claim. So they're going to say, oh, OK, so this must be legit. So it legitimizes your claim in, at the end. And you can tell the insurance company you're not trying to milk the system kind of thing. Right. Is that so? Yeah. So thanks a lot for being with us today, Constable Nightingale. Um, I appreciate all, all your wisdom and, and advice on this subject. Um, is there anything else you'd like to close with? Nope, that's everything. Uh, like I said, like I said at the beginning, uh, the septed is is it's a, a, a bigger, broader concept. Uh, I just kind of took snippets out of it, uh, which would hopefully help uh, those that may view this. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And hopefully, if anybody needs any specific questions, they can get a hold of me as the uh, community liaison here at, uh, for the Northwest Division here in Saskatoon. Excellent. Thanks again. Um, Join us again next month at Wednesday webinar. Um, thanks to the Saskatoon Police Service for all your hard work and what you do. This is recorded and will be on YouTube. So have yourself a wonderful week. Thank you.